like to laugh your head off? So I, I perform all over the world and I was doing a, a, a conference on peace and all of these women uh, were attending. It was a women's conference. And afterwards we all decided to go out and the Mexican woman said, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I think I have a tequila. And the Japanese woman said, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I think I have a sake. And the Greek woman said, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I think I have an uso. And the French woman said, I'm angry, I'm thirsty, I think I have a Beaujolais. And the Russian woman said, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I think I have a vodka. And the Jewish woman said, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I think I have diabetes. <laughs> I was just at a, uh, a dinner where they were honoring uh, this uh, lawyer who was a really well-known litigator, and they showed his bar mitzvah pictures. And in the film, an ad came on, and she turned to the audience as she said, do you know why they call it the golden years? And everybody's crying, because they can't spell fashtinkina. <laughs> Am alles gewesen, ein heißer Tag. It was once a very hot day. Eine Frau ist gegangen für einen Spazier. And a woman went for a walk. Mit dem Mann sah sie einen Mann, was für keine Woche. All of a sudden she saw a man who was selling fangs. Geht sie zu zum Mann. She went to the man. Und sagt zu ihm. And she said to him. Wie viel kostet der Woche? How much are your uh, fangs? Sagt der Mann. The man said. Ich habe für 5 Cent und ich habe für 25 Cent. I have for 5 cents and I have for 25 cents. Sagt die Frau, von mir ist gut genug 5 Cent. She said, for me it's good enough for 5 Cent one. Käf sie auf Woche und setzt sich auf Weg auf der Bank. She buys the fan and she sits down on the bench. Und sie fochert sich. And sie fochert sich. <laughs> Mit dem Mann, der fochert sie bricht sich. All of a sudden the fan is broken. Geht sie zurück zum Mann. She goes back to the man. Und sagt sie, gib mir guck, ich hab jetzt gekäft auf Woche und sie schon zu brechen. I just bought a fan and it's already broken. Sagt der Mann, wie viel hast du bezahlt für den Fächer? He asked her, how much did you spend for this fan? Fünf Cent. Five Cent. Sagt er, ah. Ah. <lacht> Sagt der Mann, für 25 Cent fächert man so. For 25 Cent, this is the way you fan yourself. Und für 5 Cent fächert man so. <lacht> I want to tell you is the story of a guy who goes into shul with his dog. It's a St. Bernard. You know what? They have those little casks of rum under there. Oh, this dog has a tallis bag. The rabbi's very polite. He says, I'm sorry, there's no dogs allowed in the shul. He says, him, you don't understand, rabbi. This is a very special dog. The dog goes woof, woof. He pulls a yarmulke out of the tallis bag. The rabbi is very polite. He says, I'm sorry. Well, he's a little interested, but no, I'm sorry. The dog barks again. This time he pulls a a talus out of the talus bag and puts it on there. Now the rabbi's a little more interested, but still politely says no. The dog barks a third time. Now he takes a cedar out of the talus bag and he's davening magnificently. Now the rabbi is so excited. He says, this is unbelievable. You should take this dog to Hollywood. Put him on, on television. Put him in films. You'll make a million dollars. The man says, well, you talk to him. He wants to be a dentist. <laughs> Well, I had two buddies. They owned a haberdashery store in downtown Dallas. Chaim and Moshe. And Chaim and Moshe was talking and he says, you know, it's already 40 years we in this business. It's already time we should, uh, you know, sell the place, go live a little bit, go for a trip, something. So Chaim says to Moshe, Moshe, where you would go? Oh, he says, this gleam in his eye, he says, I would go to Hawaii and look at the chicks dolphin on the beach. I would go to the Himalayan mountains. And then I would end up in Japanville. Hmm, where you would go? <laughs> where I would go, he says. I would go, he says, to Highland. I would go to Scotchville. And then I would go to England. God help, they sell the store. They take off. Two months later, they come back and they meet downtown Dallas. No, Moshe, what happened? Don't ask. Don't ask nothing. What do you mean, don't ask? Where you was? What happened? 
He says, I was in Hawaii looking at those goyals. They were so gorgeous. And then he says, I was in the Himalayan mountains. It was fantastic. I was in Jeppenville. And in Jeppenville, it was amazing. Where did you go? <laughs> Where did I go? Huh? I was drinking scotch with the scotch guys. I was there with the post the Protestants and the Catholics in the Highland. And then I went to England. When I stayed so long in England, I was already talking like those guys. He said, hey, if you were talking like those guys already, why you talk like this? He said, hey, once a Texan, always a Texan. <laughs> Two Orthodox Jews go to Pincus the tailor, and they want to have suits made. And they don't just want any suits made, they want black suits. And not just black suits, but the blackest of black suits. So Pincus says, OK, I'll make you the blackest of black suits. They come back a few weeks later to pick up their suits, and they put them on, and they take a look, and they go, yeah, I think they're black. OK, we're good to go. And they leave, and as they're walking down the street, they see two, see two priests walking towards them. And one of them runs up to one of the priests, and he holds his arm out against the priest, and he's muttering. He says something. He goes back to his friend, and they keep walking down the street. And one priest says to the other, what was that all about? And the second priest says, I don't know. He said something. I'm not sure what he said. It sounded like Latin. And the first priest said, yeah, I thought so too. It sounded like Pincus fucked us. <laughs> you all have heard about the early bird restaurants in Miami. People go there at 4.30 to eat and get the meal for half price if they would have gone at 6.30. In any event, this group of ladies were sitting having dinner. And one of the ladies calls the waiter over and she says, you know, it's quite cold in here. Would you be kind enough to turn the air conditioner off, please? He says, I'll be very happy to serve you, madam. And he disappears. 10 minutes later, she calls him back. She says, it's got warm in here again. Can you fix the air conditioner again? So the lady in the next uh, group sitting beside says, you know, come over here for a minute. I've got to talk to you. She says, that woman is taking advantage of you. Tell her to go and eat somewhere else. On top of that, you're so kind to her. He says, well, madam, I don't mind. We don't have an air conditioner. <laughs> so three Orthodox Jews are standing and arguing whose rabbi has the most power, has the most influence to do miracles. So the first one says, my rabbi is the best. In our town in Plotsk, there was a fire, and it looked like the whole town was going to be consumed. And my rabbi said, fire, hair off. Fire stopped, and it stopped. The second gentleman said, my rabbi, in my town in Warsaw, there was a flood. It was raining and raining and raining. It looked like all the houses were going to be swept away. And he said, regen, hair off and the rain stopped. The third one says, that's nothing. Standing right here in the corner of Glen Cairn and Bathurst, a Brinks truck was coming along the street, and a bus was coming up the street, and the bus smashes into the Brinks truck, and money's flying all over the place. And my rabbi says, Shabbos, hair off. <laughs> it's Friday morning. And a cute little Jewish man, Mr. Joachim Floster, walks into a fancy gourmet delicatessen in Yorkville. He walks straight to the counter and he says, excuse me, mister, I would like to buy some locks. And the, uh, the man behind the counter very condescendingly says, I'm sorry, we don't have locks. We only have smoked salmon. He goes, OK, sorry, my mistake. I'll take some smoked salmon. I'll take some smoked salmon. OK, and then I, I notice next to the smoked salmon, you've got some beautiful blintzes. I'd like to buy some blintzes. He goes, I'm sorry, we don't have blintzes. Those are crepes. Oh, my mistake, I'm sorry. OK, I'll take uh, half a dozen crepes. And while you're at it, I'd like to buy uh, a pound of chopped liver. He says, I'm sorry, we don't have chopped liver. We only have pate. He goes, pate, I'll take a pound and a half of pate and verset. And just one more thing, mister, can you please deliver it on Saturday? He says, I'm sorry, sir, we don't deliver on Shabbos. <laughs> It was a cold and a miserable and stormy night, and Moshe Nebech was laying on his deathbed, and he knew the time was coming. 
And he called his beloved wife, Esther, over to the bed and said, Esther, we need to call the priest. And Esther was stunned and said, Moshe, bist meshige geworden? You've gone crazy? We don't need a priest. We need the rabbi. And Moshe sits back and says, Oh, yes, there. On such a miserable night, you want to call the rabbi out? <laughs> so Moshe and Chaim, they're two elderly gentlemen, and uh, their great love of their life is baseball. And they, they do anything to watch baseball. They don't care what kind of baseball it is. It doesn't matter. They watch it all year long, 24-7. And their biggest fear is to find out what happens should they die and go to heaven. Is there baseball in heaven? So they make a pact with each other. They say, all right, you know what? The first person who dies, come back to the other one in a dream the next night and tell them whether or not there is baseball in heaven. So unfortunately, Moshe dies first. And the next night, Chaim is sleeping. And all of a sudden, he hears, psst. And Chaim says, Moshe, is that you? He says, yeah, that's me. He says, quick, tell me right away. I have to know, is there baseball in heaven? He says, well, it's like this. I have good news and I have bad news. He says, what is the good news? He says, the good news is there, there's so much baseball, it's, you can't get enough. It's impossible. It's fantastic. He says, so what could be the bad news? He says, the bad news is you're pitching on Tuesday. <laughs> These two old friends are talking and one friend says, Dorothy, tell me about your daughter, the one that's married to the surgeon. Says, oh, she's doing terrific, fine. He said, and, and, and the daughter, the one that's married to the lawyer? She's doing terrific, okay? And, and, and the one that's married to the, to, the, to the dentist, she's doing fine, fine. He says, you know, to tell you the truth, it's the same daughter. She's been married three times. He says, so much nachas from one daughter. <laughs> Sam turns to Bella in bed and he says, honey, did you know it's National Orgasm Day? She turns, she looks at him and says, what a pity, right in the middle of National Headache Week. <laughs> Lenny decided it was time he should call his mother who had moved to Florida. It had been some time and he was feeling a little guilty. So Lenny called, Ma, how are you doing? She goes, Lenny, is that you? She said, yeah, Ma, it's Lenny. How are you doing in Florida? Oh, Lenny, not so good. Oh my God, why not? Well, I'm feeling a little weak. The mother all of a sudden started sounding really sick and Lenny got really worried. Ma, what's going on? Well, I haven't eaten in 38 days. 38 days, Lenny went wild. Why haven't you eaten in 38 days? She said, Lenny, I didn't want my mouth filled in case you should call. <laughs> a young man called the rabbi, please may I come in for an appointment? I must talk to you. The rabbi said, fine. So the young man arrives, sits down. The rabbi says, so Gerald, Tell me, oh, you got a problem. He says, Rabbi, I'm 32 years old. I want to get married. I date all sorts of girls, tall, short, fat, skinny, blonde, black, Jewish, non-Jewish, whatever I bring into the house. And these are lovely girls my mother doesn't like. And I want to please my mother. I want her to shep nachas for me. And what can I do? The rabbi says, you got a problem, son. However, here's what you got to do. You gotta go out, you gotta date as many women as you can. Try to find a woman that has a lot of attributes your mother has. If she walks like her, talks or looks like her, does her hair the way, find all the body language that she has. If that woman you find, your mother will love her. Try it. He says, I'll try, Rabbi. Six months later, the rabbi gets a phone call. It's me again, can I see you? He said, come on in. So he sits beside the rabbi. The rabbi says, so tell me, how did you make out? Rabbi, I found the perfect girl. She looks like my mother. She does her hair like my mother. She's got all her movements. She cooks like her. She talks like her. It's everything. So the rabbi says, that's wonderful. So what's the matter? He says, my father doesn't like her. <laughs> Sam is driving down the highway, minding his own business, and he looks in the rearview mirror, and the police are after him. The siren is going, the lights are going. So he pulls over and the policeman comes to the car and Sam goes, what, what was I doing? What's the matter? 
He goes, sir, do you know your wife fell out of the car 10 miles back? He goes, thank God, I thought I was going deaf. <laughs> So two men were sitting on the couch watching CNN, Sam and Moishi. And Sam turns to Moishi and he says, did you hear that they made a new medication for your memory? And Moishi said, they did. What's the name of the medication? And she, he says, Sam says, well, what's the name of the flower? You know, it smells nice and it comes in different colors. And Moishi says, you mean a rose? And Sam said, yeah. Rose, what's the name of the medication? <laughs> so Abe and Sarah, Abe and Sarah, they've been married for 65 years. They go to court. They are in divorce court. And they're sitting there patiently. The judge walks in. He looks at the dossier, goes through. He says, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cohen, uh, Abe and Sarah, it, it says you, you've been married for 65 years. Yes, we have been. He says, well, 65 years. He said, that's, that's an awfully long time. He says, why have you suddenly decided to come to divorce court to get a divorce today? Abe looks up. He says, we wanted to wait till the children were dead. <laughs> a little boy comes home to his boobies and he says, boobie, what's fornication? She goes, oi, just a second. Come with me. She takes him up to her bedroom, opens up the closet takes out a little simple house dress and says, see this, this is for going shopping. Takes him to the next closet, brings out a gorgeous dress with pearls and sequins. She says, now this dress, this is for an occasion. <laughs> <laughs> a woman goes into the doctor's office and the doctor notices she's a little depressed. And he says, what's going on? And she goes, oh doctor, my husband's no longer interested in sex. He's no longer amorous, he's no longer passionate. And the doctor says, you know, we can do something for that. You know, I can give you some stuff. So she takes the vial, they're eating dinner, and she manages to slip it into his food. Well, all of a sudden he becomes so amorous, so passionate, he screws her on the table. He screws her under the table. He screws her on the table. It's great. Unfortunately, he brought some of the china, but it was fabulous. Next day, she goes into the doctor's office, big smile on her face, and the doctor says, so well, she goes, oh, doctor, just like you said, I managed to slip it into his food, and he became so amorous, so passionate, he screwed me on the table. He screwed me under the table. He screwed me on the table. Unfortunately, we broke some of the china. And the doctor says, you know, I feel a little responsible. Let me pay for part of the china. And the woman says, no, doctor, don't worry. We're never going back to that restaurant again. <laughs> a Frenchman, Italian, and a Jew we're talking about the lovemaking techniques. And the Frenchman says, well, when I want to make love to my wife, I get nice, fresh, creamery butter. I warm it up in the oven. I massage her gently with it. And we make passionate love. And she could moan and groan for 20, 25 minutes. The Italian says, I'm a don't to use a butter, but I'm going to use a nice, a virgin olive oil. I warm it up, massage my wife. She could moan and groan for up to 30 minutes. Jake says, well, he says, I don't use butter, and I don't use olive oil. I use nice, warm chicken schmaltz. And the last time I massaged my wife all over, she didn't stop yelling for over an hour. They said, what could you do that would make her yell for over an hour? He says, I bite my hands on the drapes. So Sam is an elderly man, and he's decided that he wants to have one last fling, and he calls in a call girl. She arrives in his apartment, and he opens the door. She comes in, and she starts to disrobe, and he says to her, fun minute. Before we do anything, I like to have a bath. She says, what? He says, I like to have a bath. Well, she's being paid, so she goes into the bath with him, and they're sitting in the bath, and he says, and when I'm in the bath, I like there should be waves. She says, where am I gonna get waves? He says, you go like this and like this, like this and like this. 
So she makes the waves for him and he says, and mid the waves, I like there should be thunder. She says, where am I going to get thunder? He says, with the toilet. You go like this, like this, and you make the waves and the thunder and the waves and the thunder. And he says, and with the waves and the thunder, I like there should be lightning. She says, where am I going to get lightning? He says, you turn the light off and on and the thunder and the lightning, the lightning and the thunder and the waves. And she says, and when do we have sex? And he says, in such a storm. <laughs> So there's an elderly gentleman in a hospital bed and a voluptuous, beautiful young nurse comes in and she says, I'm here to give you a bath. And he says to her, can you come here for just a second? And she comes over and he says, it's very important for me to know, are my testicles black? And she looks at him and she says, I'm really just here to give you a bath and just your upper body and your lower legs, so let me take care of that. She gives him a very thorough bath where she's supposed to. She finishes and she figures he's forgotten and she's gonna leave the room. So he calls her over, he says, I need to ask you, it's very important to me. Are my testicles black? And she says, well, I'm really not supposed to do this, but I will. So she lifts off the blankets, she lifts up the appropriate area, she checks very thoroughly, very carefully, lifts up, looks around, moves from side to side, she's convinced. Puts him all back together, puts the bed back together, and she says to him, I can assure you that your testicles are not black. And he calls her over again. He says, I'm afraid you misunderstood my original request. She says, what was it? And he says, are my test results back? <laughs> Bernie? Yes, I, Ma? I have gotten finally the most incredible hearing aid. Really? I've searched all over and this is the most sophisticated hearing aid that I have ever, ever seen in my life. Really? What, what kind is it? It's about quarter after eight. <laughs> so a police officer stops a guy that's speeding. He says, what's your name? Speeder says, Fred. He says, what kind of name's Fred? He says, well, I used to be known as Fred Johnson. So a long time ago, I became a doctor, and I was Fred Johnson, MD. Then I got bored with medicine, went into dentistry. I became Fred Johnson, MD, DDS. Then I started to fool around with my assistant, and she gave me VD. I was Fred Johnson, MD, DDS with VD. Then the Dental Association heard I had VD. They took away the DDS. I was Fred Johnson, MD with, D, with VD. Then the Medical Association took away the MD because they heard I had VD. Then I was Fred Johnson with VD. Then the VD took away my Johnson. Now I'm just Fred. <laughs> this man is sitting in a restaurant with his wife. And all of a sudden, this gorgeous blonde walks in, comes right up to him, gives him a tremendous kiss right on the lips. His wife gets like this. She says, what? She looks at him. She says, who was that? He says, that was my mistress. She says, you're what? And she starts to get upset. He says, listen, before you get excited, if you get too excited, just remember, no more fur coats, no more trips to Paris, no more condo in Florida, no more trips around the world, forget it all. And just as when he's telling her that, she sees his best friend walk into the restaurant also with another girl. And he says, and she, he, she says to him, who's that over there with your friend? He says, that's his girlfriend. She says, ours is prettier. <laughs> the restaurant opens. Every day, Moisha comes in. He sits by the same table. The waitresses all love to see him come in. One day, he doesn't come in. The next day, he doesn't come in. The boss at the restaurant starts to worry. Where the hell is he? He can't be worried. He's busy, so he looks after everybody. The next day, he doesn't come in. He says, now I'm really worried. So he calls his sister in Miami, and she doesn't know where he is. He hasn't heard from him. And then he sees him walking into the restaurant across the road. He goes running up to him. He says, Mendel, what are you doing? Every day you come to my restaurant, you have coffee, you have tzimis, and the waitresses love you. What are you doing? He says, shh, hell, astonished, listening. I went to the dentist the other day. He gave me a Woods Canal. And he told me, he says, for a couple days, you'll eat on the other side. 
Well, who could forget the Blue Jays' final game five against the Texas Rangers? What a night, it'll never be forgotten. Fabulous game, full house, completely sold out. People are like killing for a seat. They spend thousands of dollars to get a seat, completely sold out. The Bernsteins have seats, they go to the game, they settle in, game starts. About halfway through the first inning, they notice behind them there's an empty seat. Well, it's driving them crazy. The, the curiosity is overwhelming. And finally, she turns behind, and Mrs. Bernstein says to the woman, what's with the empty seat? Do you know whose seat that is and why it's empty? The lady behind says, yes, that's the seat of my late husband. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bernstein says. I, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm very sorry. Please, I, I apologize. They sit back and watch the game. By the fifth in inning, Mrs. Bernstein's mind is just going crazy. She has to ask the question. She turns to the lady behind and says, excuse me, I don't mean to be rude. I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm thinking it's such an important game. The seats are so valuable and such, a, such excitement here. Don't you have a family member or a friend who you could have invited to be with you? And she says, I have plenty, but they're all at the funeral. <laughs> so rabbi, minister, priest meet every week, and they talk about things ecunemical. Conversation comes up. What would they like people to say about them after they've died? The priest says, when I'm lying in my coffin, I want the people to look down and say, there lies Father Joseph, the kindest priest that the church has ever seen. He was a good man. He was a fair man. He was particularly kind to the little choir boys in the choir. He was a good, good father. And uh, the minister says, well, I would like people to look in my coffin and, 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 and say, there lies Father Watson, very good minister. He was a, he was a, he was a, a good sermon giver. He was, he was kind to all the people in the hospital and the ladies' church brigade. I, I just want them to say I was a fair man. The rabbi says, when I'm lying in my coffin, I want them to say, look! He's moving! <laughs> a man and his wife were living in the condo in Miami and they decided to go on a cruise. Now, you may be offended when I tell you this joke, but please forgive me. They go on the cruise and the ship is just pulling away from the shore when she says, Oh, Sam, I forgot my hearing aids. What will we do? Sam says, Don't worry, you'll be fine. She said, But we're going to be away a whole week. What will we do? He said, don't worry, I'll talk close to you, I'll talk in your ear when they say something. You'll manage, don't worry. So they do for the first day. That night, they're going to bed in their little, their little stateroom, and it's an upper and lower bunk. So he turns, he says, Sadie, up or down? She runs at him, she tears his shirt off, throws him on the bed, and she gives him the most wonderful sex he's had in 40 years. He wakes up smiling, of course, and they go through the next day, he's talking in her ear, they manage, and they go to bed at night, the same thing. He says, Sadie, up or down? Again, she attacks him. He loves it. This goes on for seven days. At the end of the cruise, they dock and they go back to the condo. The first thing she does, she runs into the bedroom and the dresser is her hearing aid. She puts him on. Oh, Sam, thank God, now I can hear. He says, Sadie, I want to tell you the best holiday I had in my life. You were wonderful. It was like a honeymoon. He says, all, all I had to do is I turned to the bunk and I said, up or down, and you did the most beautiful sex. She says, that's what you said. I thought you said fuck or drown. <laughs> Little old lady on the beach in Miami is playing with her grandson. Suddenly a huge wave rolls in, sky goes dark, picks the kid up, pulls him out to sea, disappears under the wave. She drops to her knees, lifts her eyes to heaven, and she says, Oi, God, I'll do anything. Bring me back my grandson. I'll join Hadassah. I'll give to the UJA. I'll plant a tree in Israel. Bring back my grandson. Suddenly, the sky turns light. The sun comes out. The wave rolls gently back onto the beach, and the kid is safe and sound. She drops to her knees, lifts her eyes to heaven, and says, He had a hat. <laughs> So did you hear about the Pope's recent trip that he took to Los Angeles? Well, let me tell you, he landed in Los Angeles and at the end of the trip, he turned to his driver and said, I've always wanted to see Las Vegas and we're so close, let's go. So they hop in the car and about halfway along the trip, 
The Pope tells the driver to stop and says, get out of the car. He says, the real reason that I wanted to go to Vegas is not to go to Vegas, but these are desert roads and I've always wanted to drive the Pope Mobile. The driver says, I don't think this is a good idea. He says, I'm the boss, you get in the back and I'll drive. So the driver gets in the back, the Pope starts driving, puts his foot on the floor, 100 kilometers an hour, 150, 200, 250. All of a sudden, the sirens start wailing. The police pull over the Pope. They see him in the car. The officer takes his microphone. He steps away from the car, and he calls his chief. He says, Chief, I think I've stopped somebody really important. He says, who is it? Is it a congressman? He says, no, I think he's more important than a congressman. Is it a senator? He says, no, I think it's more important than a senator. He says, is it the President of the United States? He says, no. He says, well, who could be more important than the President of the United States? He says, I don't know, but his driver's the Pope. <laughs> I have a neighbor, very nice lady. And she had a daughter in Israel. She had another daughter living in Montreal. And the daughter in Montreal came to Toronto and they was talking. She says, you know, I would love to go visit Haike in Israel, but you know, I can't fly. What do you mean, can't fly? What's the matter? I'm so afraid it's terrible. She said, Mama, it's nothing. You sit in this beautiful airplane. Just... But what will happen if, um, if I have to go with the movie, you know? No problem. There's a bathroom in the back. There's a bathroom in the front. Not a problem. And what will be if I'm hungry? Mama, did they serve food? You know what? I'm going to pack you a satchel. I'm going to make you a satchel with a zipper. And don't worry. Now, you got to know that this zipper and this package was her security blanket. So she sits on the plane. And there's a seat by the window. She puts the satchel by the window. And she's got one eye on the satchel. And you know when you fly to Israel, they close the lights. It gets dark. She falls asleep. The guy on the other side decides there's an empty seat by the window. He goes over and sits down, takes the satchel, puts it under the seat, doesn't, wake, doesn't want to wake up the mummel. And he sits down and he falls asleep. A couple of minutes later, she wakes up. And she right away, she reaches over for the zipper. And sure enough, she finds the zipper and opens up the zipper, puts it in her hand, and she says, Oh my God, what a tochter I have. She made my chicken and the neck is still warm. <laughs> Abe and Sarah, they make a pact one day. They've been married again about 60 years. They make a pact. Sarah looks at Abe and says, you know, we're both getting so old. One of us is, sooner or later, one of us is gonna die. What do you wanna do? Abe says, I'll tell you what, the first one will die is one year to the day. We'll come back and visit. So it's a beautiful, wonderful idea. So sure enough, time goes by, Abe is uh, the first one to die. Sarah counts down the days, one year to the day. She's in bed, and a vision appears at the end of her bed, and sure enough, there's Abe. Oi, 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 Abe. She said, I can't believe it. He says, well, I'm here. She says, oi, Abe, it's so wonderful to see you. But please, please, tell me, tell me, what's it like? She says, well, you know, I get up in the morning. I have a nice breakfast. I go out. I have sex for a while. I lie down, I have a nap, I get up, I have a nice, beautiful lunch. I have sex for a while again. I lie down, I have a good sleep, I get up, I have a nice meal, I have a beautiful spread in front of me, I have what to eat. I, I have sex for a while. Then I lie down in bed, go to sleep for the night, get up in the morning, same thing every day. Sarah shakes her head, she looks, she says, Abe, Abe, oi, 
God, that just sounds so wonderful. He said, I can't wait till I'm in heaven. He looks down and he says, heaven? Who's in heaven? I'm a bull in Montana. 